Hello everyone, welcome to History and Culture. Johnston lived in China for more than 30 years and was a true China expert. From 1919 to 1924, as Pui's English teacher, he witnessed and participated in a series of ups and downs experienced by Pui. In 1919, recommended by Li Jingmai, the son of Li Hongzhang, Johnston was appointed by the Qing court, through President Su Shichang, as Pui's English teacher for the Weihaiwei Administrative Commissioner. At that time, Pui was 13 years old. A child who had almost never lived with his parents and spent his early years inside the Forbidden City, he preferred watching camels sneeze over caring about the fate of the elderly and the small court. Johnston's arrival changed Pui's adolescence. When they first met, Pui followed the etiquette of receiving foreign ministers, bowing to Johnston before shaking hands. Then, Johnston stepped outside, and Pui bowed to him again, formalizing their student-teacher relationship. At that time, Pui already had several Chinese teachers who taught him to read, including Chen Baochen. However, their main teaching to Pui was to attempt the restoration of the ancestral heritage and the completion of a restoration. Johnston was different. His blue eyes and blonde hair, initially unsettling to Pui, became an important support and consolation. Pui almost became Johnston's entire ideal. In his book, Twilight in the Forbidden City, Johnston referred to Pui as my young dragon, expressing his hope that this dragon would truly soar with wings one day. Pui, in his autobiography, From Emperor to Citizen, recalled, Chen Baochen was originally my only soul. However, since Johnston came, I gained another soul. Despite the long days and the influence of several elderly advisors who emphasized the desire for restoration, Johnston did open up a new world for the young ex-emperor, where he was not just a prisoner of the Forbidden City, a person without will. Johnston himself was fascinated by ancient Chinese culture, studying Confucianism and Buddhism, appreciating tea and peonies. However, he was eager to let Pui understand Western modern civilization and the changing international situation. During classes, he often brought foreign magazines for Pui to see, trying to familiarize him with airplanes and tanks depicted in them. One day, he brought a box of candies, explaining to Pui how the beautiful tin box and the taste of fruit candies were produced using machines and chemical methods. Pui couldn't comprehend these things. He grew tired of his teacher's words, took the candies, and went to the courtyard, wanting ants on the cypress to taste the flavor of chemistry and machinery. Johnston was very patient with his student, waiting until the end of the class. Johnston's gentlemanly humility and self-respect were in line with his desire to educate Pui to become a gentleman. What Pui remembered most, however, was the superiority of Western civilization in objects because of Johnston's influence. Due to Johnston, Pui developed a liking for Western furniture and woolen fabrics, considering Western music superior to Chinese silk strings. Because Johnston, like many Westerners, mocked the cues of Chinese people as pig tails, Pui decided to cut off his cue. Since the second year of the Republic of China, there had been suggestions within the Ministry of Internal Affairs to persuade those in the Forbidden City to cut off their queues. However, the Imperial Household Department always found various reasons to evade the issue. The teenage Pui finally, despite the advice of his usual teachers, completed this small revolution. He ordered a eunuch to shave off his queue, but the eunuch dared not, so he went into another room and personally cut off his queue. In Pui's history of personal independence, this was one of the few steps forward. His action brought tears to the imperial concubines, and some Chinese teachers were dissatisfied, especially those who couldn't stand Pui following Johnston's propaganda. Pui's haircut sparked a trend of cutting queues in the small court. Within a few days, over a thousand queues were gone, even though Pui was a decade behind the trend outside the Forbidden City. Living in the Forbidden City, Pui originally had little freedom. As he grew older, conflicts intensified between him and the courtiers. 
He didn't like to follow routine rituals and had the palace threshold sawed off for the convenience of riding a bicycle. He also entertained the idea of studying abroad. At that time, the old courtiers in the small court strongly opposed the plan to study abroad. The main reason for the opposition was that if Puyi went abroad, it would be equivalent to giving up the conditions for the preferential treatment of the Qing dynasty provided by the Republic of China government when Puyi abdicated. This preferential treatment was crucial for the survival and restoration dreams of these old figures. Since he didn't receive support from the small court, Puyi secretly started preparing for an escape. He found his brother, Pujia, who shared his desire to leave. Their preparations seemed absurd to adults, as Pujia's companion, he would bring a large package home every day after class, containing the most valuable calligraphy and paintings and ancient books in the Forbidden City, preparing funds for the escape. The objects they smuggled out included invaluable works by Wang Shiji, Wang Xianji, and paintings of Emperor Gaozong of the Song Dynasty. All of this was for the elusive freedom they yearned for in their early teens. Their second step in escaping was secretly leaving the Forbidden City. By 1923, he sought advice from Johnston and contacted the chief envoy of the Dutch embassy, Mr. Alden Camp. Alden Camp had already agreed to help him. Puyi spent money to bribe eunuchs and planned to slip out through the Shen woman. However, before he even stepped out of the Yangtzeindian, he heard that someone had informed the Imperial Household Department about this plan. Puyi's father, Prince Chun, ordered all palace gates to be closed. His escape plan failed. For a long time, Puyi felt that the preferential conditions he received were shameful and preferred to give them up. He thought of Emperor Chongzhen of the Ming Dynasty and felt pessimistic about the fate of the last emperor. In his teens, Puyi did not think about the issue of preferential treatment, he only wished for a peaceful life without the harm of rulers. It can be said that at this time, he had not completely abandoned the desire to become a commoner. However, he was constrained by his status and the surrounding environment, making it impossible for him to take that path. With no hope of escape, Johnston comforted his student to temporarily set aside the plan to go abroad and focus on reforming the affairs within the Forbidden City. Johnston had long believed that the decline and fall of the Qing dynasty were closely related to the cumbersome Internal Affairs Department, which he called the Vampire of the Qing Court. The Internal Affairs Department was an institution that existed only in the Qing dynasty and was absent in other dynasties. Its chief was called the Chief Minister of the Internal Affairs Department, and it was filled by Manchu princes, nobles, or Manchu ministers. By the Guangxu era, the Internal Affairs Department had various departments under its jurisdiction, making it an extremely large organization. The ministers of the Internal Affairs Department included several officials like Langzhong, Yuanweilong, and Zhu Shi. Eunuchs also fell under the jurisdiction of the Internal Affairs Department. The ministers of the Internal Affairs Department acted as the Emperor's stewards, having powers that other Yamans could not obtain. However, due to the large number of people and the mixed responsibilities, corruption often occurred in accounting and property management. Johnston hoped to reform this outdated institution and reduce unnecessary expenses. He repeatedly told Puyi that the Internal Affairs Department had a motto, which was to maintain the status quo, making any reform impossible when it encountered this institution. Johnston's views on the Internal Affairs Department finally led to Puyi's determination to reform it. Puyi's first step in reform was to disband the eunuchs. In 1922, when Puyi was 16, Johnston reported to him that eunuchs were stealing and selling palace treasures on a large scale, and the situation was getting worse. Upon hearing this, Puyi decided to inspect his own property. Although he and Pujia had secretly taken out many treasures, he did not know that everyone was stealing his belongings. However, shortly after the inventory of the property began, a fire broke out one night, burning all the valuables in the Jianfu Palace. Puyi suspected that someone deliberately set the fire. Not only that, 
he became nervously concerned that someone might harm him. In the end, he made a decision to disband all the eunuchs except for a few who had to be retained by the Empress Dowagers. Moreover, Puai decided to continue using his power as the head of the household. He selected several trusted old courtiers to manage affairs within the Forbidden City. The appointed ministers included well-known figures like Xing Xiaoxiu, Luo Zhenyu, and Wang Guowei. However, things did not go as planned. The chief minister of the Internal Affairs Department, Xing Xiaoxiu, was squeezed out by those corrupt officials who hated him before he could implement his reform, downsizing personnel, and cutting costs. Puai discovered that several ministers had sold his antiques for a good price. Johnston had repeatedly expressed his expectations for the ex-emperor in his letters, his true educational philosophy, hoping to change the ex-emperor's life and thoughts, allowing him to have a modern and healthy personality and body, not just revolving around royal power for survival. He often suggested that the ex-emperor move to the Summer Palace to escape the dark and oppressive environment of the Forbidden City. When he first became the emperor's teacher, Johnston wrote in a letter to a friend, if the ex-emperor continues to be portrayed as different from others, then undoubtedly he has failed as a person. Such a person is extremely unsuitable to be a king. If he continues to be instilled with the idea of someday returning to the throne and eventually finds disillusionment, then he will have no ability to be a person in this world. On the contrary, if he is educated to be a Chinese gentleman with independent thinking, patriotic spirit, and culture, a true gentleman, then he will be able to handle any job happily when needed in the future. Unfortunately, he did not see Puai become a true emperor or witness him become a self-sufficient commoner. The independent personality in the ex-emperor was only a fleeting moment. In 1924, Feng Yuxiang launched a coup, occupied the Forbidden City, and forcefully demanded that Puai leave the Forbidden City and accept the revised preferential conditions for the Qing court. By the end of the year, Puai hurriedly fled to the Japanese embassy, later relocating to Tianjin, falling irreversibly under Japanese control, and irretrievably heading down the wrong path. In 1930, Britain returned the leased land of Weihaiwai to China, and Johnston, who had returned to work in Weihaiwai, was ordered to return to Britain. Before returning home, he went to Tianjin to bid farewell to Puai. Puai was reluctant to part with him and gave Johnston the last gift, a folding fan with two farewell poems transcribed on it. The emotional expression of such attachment and sadness for someone was rare in Puai's life. In 1938, Johnston passed away in Edinburgh. In his later years, he bought a small island in Scotland, raised the flag of a Manchu Kuo, and filled the exhibition room with items Puai had once given him, reliving his dream of being a former Qing courtier. In his heart, his student was still a person with integrity, enlightenment, and moral perfection. In the conclusion of Twilight in the Forbidden City, Johnston wrote, those who truly understand the ex-emperor's character know that he will not enjoy his good fortune peacefully. He wants to enjoy it and he wants his people to enjoy it as well. Clearly, Johnston's fantasy was ultimately shattered. This is History and Culture Channel, like, and, subscribe, are the biggest help and support for us, thank you everyone, see you next time.